Welcome to room B. For those of you who were in the other session uh, just now, my name is Jamie Reynolds. I am with my text and I am the MC for this room. Very uh, pleased to, uh, to be your MC for these few sessions. Before we get started, I wanted to take just a minute to remind you of the wireless information in case you're looking for it. Um, it is the FCAT Auditorium Network and the password is SPRING2013 with a capital S. So this next session is a deep dive into programmatic marketing, um, and it is being presented by one of today's sponsors, as well as a, a dear friend of my text and a great leader here in the Boston area, DataZoo. We're going to be hearing from their two co-founders, uh, Mike Baker and Sandro Catanzaro. Did I pronounce it right? Perfect. Thank you. There we go. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things over oh, to them so we can right. get right Thanks started. So. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Hi, I'm Mike Baker. Um, and I am the co-founder and CEO of DataZoo. I'm also a board member of MyTex. And uh, before we do our thing, I thought it would just be great to acknowledge um, what an awesome job MyTex is doing, bringing the local community together. It's been really fun. I've been on the board about a year watching the momentum build. So um, from the e-commerce to the mobile to the data stuff, um, really impressive work and great, great for our community. Um, also, thanks to Fidelity. It's great to have a big anchor brand in town who's hel helping to uh, provide very nice space with good acoustics for us. Um, Sandra, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, it, it's been a pleasure to work in this Boston community. I'm one, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. I came here to study in school and uh, have stayed forever. And I really like uh, the, way, the way things work here. Thank you. Good. Well, we're pleased to talk to you today about customer-centric marketing. Um, on the chairs, we've left a case study. So um, there's a lot of people talking about data-driven this and that and analytics this and that, but there's not a lot of like hard data coming out. Like, what are the percentage savings? What is the per percentage increase in efficacy of marketing outcomes? Um, and what's neat about um, what's neat about this case study is Forrester has written about one of our largest customers, Ford, and their agency about how they're implementing software like data is used to, to actually move the needle big time on major marketing budgets. So um, that's on your chairs. What we're going to talk about, first of all, is the high-level concept of, you've heard this term programmatic media, buying and selling, or programmatic marketing. I'm going to talk about what is that, what's the opportunity, um, and what are the sort of solutions available. Sandra's then going to talk a little bit more specifically about it. And then we're going to wrap up by walking through the Ford case study to sort of try to make all this stuff more tangible and real. Um, so before we begin, just briefly, DataZoo, we went to market three and a half years ago doing real-time bidding and programmatic media buying and selling using the combinatorial math uh, PhD work of Sandro and, and uh, our other co-founder, Bill. Um, so you're, you're, the nice thing is I'm a, I'm a business person and I'm a marketer. And Sandro has the background of working with NASA and really having the goods when it comes to real-time decisioning, data, and analytics. So, you know, it's funny. This is what marketing has become is a fusion. It's a fusion space now um, where it's really fun for people like me to partner, I think, hopefully Sandro feels the same way, with people like Sandro to sort of just, you know, kind of invent the future. And for, from my perspective, I mean, the application of a very hardcore technique, mathematical, you know, very, very cool, but actual application in, in the real world to solve a real business problem is extremely interesting. I think it's a, a kind of breaking ground here. Cool. So let's get into it. Um, to understand the space, you have to really start with what's happening with consumers, right? Because all marketing is really about the customer and the consumers. And we have this just, you know, sea change happening with behavior. Um, and the behavior is really happening because of the digital devices and the lifestyle. So it's, it's not an understatement to say, you know, the consumer is firmly in the driver's seat now. And if you're a marketer or an agency or a publisher, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case in the age of data scarcity and, you know, fewer media choices. But now with so many choices and so many devices and uh, so many fragments, frankly, for how our attention time is invested you know, as, as consumers or, or even the utility of all these digital devices, um, there's been a, just a big change in, in the control. Um, and the question for marketers is, how do I sort of catch up with a consumer? Um, and, I, and I think that you know, it's now becoming sort of obvious to everybody that the legacy methods, legacy ways of working are, are no longer effective. And there's lots of data points on this at a high level, just reading the paper um, you know, from last week, you can read about Omnicom and Publicis merging 
to make this giant you know, ad agency holding company behemoth. Why is that happening? Well, you know, the CEOs say, well, because technology is coming into our space and it's changing the way we work and it's changing who we compete with. Other people say, well, they're just doing it to get better buying power um, from the media suppliers, and that may be. But um, we are seeing active change now, uh, positioning um, new ways, processes, people, and tools. So one size fits all customer experience, which has been the prevailing norm of mass media, is, is increasingly sort of untenable for a world in which you know, the consumer chooses who they engage with. Um, these siloed efforts, which are reflected in our marketing departments, in the way we organize our agency, I'm the search team, I'm the display team, I'm the mobile team, that doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, that's still the way we work, but consumers don't think that way. They just think the way they think, and the device is just a means to an end. So device-specific, channel-specific workflow doesn't actually make sense. This is like timed. It's cool. It's going ahead of me. Um, and then relying on hunches in history. The storytelling art uh, uh, part of advertising is definitely not dead. Um, and anybody who says that is, uh, you know, doesn't get it. Uh, creativity and strategic communications are very much alive, except now you can start to do the planning for that as well as the evaluation with a lot more data and information. So I, I, I'm, I for one, get really impatient with these people who pit creative versus analytics. And I was like, you know, that, that's, that's, that's telling for something that's new and threatening to people, but these are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they coexist very well. And it's actually interesting to see how little work is being done among the creative community or creative agencies using data and analytics. And I do think that's a huge opportunity um, for some of our you know, creative wonder kind here, even in Boston. Um, so OK, data and analytics are transforming marketing. Um, what's behind that? The common denominator when you're trying to engage, understand and engage the customer is actually the customer data. And you know, again, across all these channels, and just thinking holistically about the person on the other end of who you're trying to engage. And um, huge opportunity, but you know, here's the beginning of the problem. Um, the legacy ways of working tools and, and processes really aren't well suited to thinking this way. This is why this Ford case study is really interesting, not only because they're using software from a company like DataZoo, like actually using software, which is new to marketing and media management, but changing the way they pool budgets among brand managers um, to base it on consumer behaviors. So there is a new approach required, and you know, it is data-driven. Um, and here I'm going to just talk briefly about this term programmatic. We, we heard John Wren, the CEO of Omnicom, talk about how you know, most of media will be bought programmatically in, in, in several years. We heard IPG today said 50% of our business, uh, you know, large agency holding company, will be programmatic. Um, so what does this mean? Raise your hand if, if you've heard this term before. It's a little bit of an inside term. So programmatic means you know, the idea that you are um, actually able to collect information about your consumers, um, both existing and new targets, um, apply business rules, uh, you know, which is a simple word for the fancy word algorithms to this, um, to make decisions in, in sort of runtime at the speed of life about what creative message is, is, is being shown to your you know, target consumer right now. And you know, the idea is to actually measure the interactions on the fly and to continuously adjust them so as to optimize the marketing outcomes or reduce the input costs or ideally both. So that's programmatic marketing. And um, this is made possible by APIs. You guys, Sandra, what's an API? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's basically a way to communicate between two different protocols, two different machines and externalizes with an interface, which is specified, and then it's easy for these two machines to talk and get to an agreement what one wants to try to say the other. So we have now Google and Facebook and, and uh, you know, sort of 30 other companies having set up APIs where the, the, the brands and advertisers uh, can have a machine sort of speak to the selling machine, ask it what's for sale, uh, what data do you have right now? And, and, and the buying machine on the other side of the API ca uh, can programmatically um, form a willingness to pay and an investment decision based on the brand's data, right? which is a new concept. Not Google's algorithm, the brand's algorithm, the brand's data. So really interesting new world of programmatic marketing. This is what it looks like. A consumer loads 
uh, a page on the web, or it could be a mobile device or email, and now we're even seeing this with set-top boxes. We're starting to do some limited dynamic insertion of ads, which is a fascinating pilot. Um, and when the ad is to be inserted, actually, uh, a request is made um, for an ad, and that request then goes out to a company like Google or Facebook, who's running a giant ad exchange where they're conducting real-time auctions. And these real-time auctions happen in 100 milliseconds end-to-end, -end, and this is for all manner of display ads. You know, obviously, this is kind of a search model to begin with. Um, a number of parties bid, bid using software on the impression. Uh, the winning bid then gets to serve the creative, and the consumer sees an ad. This whole process uh, transpires in 100 milliseconds. Well, what DataZoo does is we make the software to make de that makes decisions in about 10 milliseconds um, for about a million queries, at in incoming ad queries a second. So this whole thing has gotten very big and very complicated and highly automated. This is what's behind programmatic marketing. When we hear these big agency holding companies say, hey, technology is changing our business, this is what they're talking about. But what I want to focus on is not sort of how to buy a su and sell an ad. I want to focus on the data part. Because how do you know what to pay? How do I know what to bid for that ad that's loading on you know, boston.com at you know, 1230 on a Thursday? Um, and if you make sense to buy it, right? You should, maybe you shouldn't buy it at all. Right. There is conflicting what you are, what you are trying to say. Yeah, and, and isn't it revolutionary? What if, what if I knew the customer is simply not who I'm looking for, right? What if I knew it was somebody like me being shown an ad for a pickup truck? Well, I would know if I really had studied this that like, that's just a flat out waste of money. Under no circumstances will Mike Baker buy a pickup truck, but actually could be persuaded to buy a lot of other things from Chevy or Ford. So right there is a huge opportunity knowing your customer to sort of, I'll put it in the pejorative, eliminate waste um, rather than, than do anything even more fancy. So what are the benefits here? We're going to get into the details about how this works. But um, at a high level, the benefits of this sort of customer-centric centric programmatic marketing is just efficiency, right? Eliminating waste and automating manual work. The agencies, um, the media planning and buying agencies, and by the way, raise your hand if you're a media planner or a buyer. Do we have many in the room? So a couple, the business is changing pretty quickly and people are using software. It's not just your old fashioned send out an IO, insertion order, RFP, RFQ for media. It's like use data analytics tools yourselves to connect to the APIs to buy intelligently what is best for your client. So eliminate waste, automate manual work. Um, and then on the upside, you know, personalizing the experience to the consumer, um, which is really um, still in its infancy, but really exciting because if you can't engage your consumers right now, it, you know, forget it, it's over, um, and it's a pretty high bar. And I would say lastly is, look, all of our customers aren't the same. If your business is anything like ours, the top 20% of your, of your customer base is really, really valuable and profitable, and you know, that's what makes the business go. You want more of those customers, not just like a low CPA. Like it, it's, kind of, it's funny the way we think of that now, especially in the internet. It's like, oh, did my C, CPA go down? It's like, well, I mean, in a way, like, what are you selling? Is it a $5 item or a $5,000 item? What's the lifetime value of that customer? Marketers are really starting to get a lot more thoughtful and smart in doing that analysis um, as they think, what, is, what, is, what amount of money am I willing to invest? And are all the conversions I'm getting equal? So, you know, people are digging deeper. And um, perhaps on that note, it's a good time to start to dig in a little bit and say, um, these insights about customers separating, you know, some from others and the value, what does that look like when you're using data and analytics? And, and here's an example sure. that Sandro can take Any us through. Any Jaguar, not Rover, Cadillac users here? Any what? Any people who drives a Jaguar or a Cadillac? Jaguar. Or Jaguar. Or a Cadillac. Land Rover? No? We're in no? Fidelity. Come on, you guys are one percenters, aren't you? So those folks... Those folks <laughs> were very interested in researching this financial product but none of them actually decided to purchase it. On the contrary, if you look, Mini and Infinity, people who drove those cars, not only researched, but also were very interested in the product. So the car you drive tells a lot about you. The car you drive kind of paints a picture of the type of things you actually value. This is the type of insight you can start getting with a new data overlays on, on, on what the consumers are doing. So what's, what's interesting about this to me is it's behavioral. Um, 
you have the shopping behavior around a financial services product indexed against car ownership. So this is like in contrast to sort of demographic data or geographic data, which is how we have segmented our customer base forever. Now you have these sort of new digital behaviors that dimensionalize the consumer. Exactly. And you not only understand, I mean, the demographic part of who they are, but also what they value. What is the psychographic profile of this person? And you got some thinking, not only how to reach them, but also what type of message to show. And this is the thing that we think is fundamentally, uh, fundamentally different. Uh, here we have another analysis. Uh, this is how to reach them. So people who are buying the products for this financial company are probably easier to reach uh, through high definition uh, programs. Uh, they prefer iPhones. They're not so much into BlackBerry, and for sure they are not into online gaming. Uh, so you know so nobody's into BlackBerry these days, but um, <laughs> so, the, so the size of this circle in this case, so it's under the red line, it's under indexed as a population, the BlackBerry users, and uh, the size of the circle is how many of them there are. Right. But what's interesting about this is there's a lot, right? Um, and it's, 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 it's markedly underperforming in terms of, what, what is the product here that? Uh, it's a financial services product. Financial services product. So another, I mean, this is, an, this is, a, is sort of an interesting way, DVR users, a way to look at consumer electronic usage relative to um, behaviors for this particular financial services company. Now, if we go to the next slide. You, you want me to? So, uh, customer-centric marketing. Uh, very cool word, very interesting. What does it really mean? I mean, you guys have companies and have product lines, uh, budgets, departments. Frankly, the customer couldn't care less. The customer what wants what they want, and they want it now. We need a chocolate, a compact car, a high fiber cereal, and uh, they really are interested in you reaching them the right way. So the good thing about this is that with the new, with the advent of new uh, of big data, if you listen intently, you can really know what they want. Not only what they want, but who they are, and that is the tenet of the new revolution of uh, online advertising. Uh, being able to use these big data sets to to kind of tune and fine tune in real time what you are talking, what what, what you are telling to them. So now the other thing is uh, the attention of the customer is fraction. It's structured. It's now customers are going from one channel to another channel, and they expect you to deliver an experience as seamless. So how can you understand this customer as it travels through uh, the discovery of your, of your need of your product? And uh, again, data and software can help you here. So now you can see which sequences were most successful in convincing somebody from going from awareness to uh, consideration and finally creating a conversion. And let's look to an example. So uh, we have here our prototypical New England entrepreneur, Mike. Uh-oh. <laughs> Mike went to uh, Brown University and the University of South Carolina. South Carolina, the University of Southern oh, California. Sorry, South California. <laughs> your, data, your data is dirty, Sandro Catanzaro. South California. <laughs> uh, here we go. Brown and South Cal Cal Southern California. I'll get you. He lives in Ethan. He commutes every day with a T to, to work. Love and train. he recently, ah, he uh, vacations in Nova Scotia. Two days, I'll be there. <laughs> and he recently purchased uh, biking equipment uh, for a charity event he's riding on. That's Bike MS. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, oh, yeah. Mike has a son who's an 18-year-old who's a freshman is going to go to school. And he's also purchasing um, a few things that you're using at dorm. So, who's Mike? And the thing is, 
you can actually uh, use multiple signals to understand who Mike really is. So not, it's not only uh, the things he has done, but the places where he is at, the type of websites, for example, he's visiting. Now, with knowing who Mike is, you can start thinking of a targeting, how to target Mike as a consumer, right? This is nothing new. I mean, you invest in certain segment. Mike seems to be like in your biking. You invest in four, four funds, and you get certain number of conversions. Nothing new, really. What is really new is that now the targeting options are millions. You can target about 20, 25,000 segments. Uh, you can target by zip code, which have 80,000 zip codes. You can target by websites, and there are hundreds of millions of websites. So how do you make sense of all this? You need software. And that's, again, the benefit of big data. With big data, you can understand which segments are actually over and under indexing for a given type of conversion. And for example, we have for this product, uh, baby boomers, trendy homemakers were over indexing. Uh, I believe this is a car manufacturer. And it's not only that you get to know this after, I don't know, six months of running a campaign, you get a report. You can get actually to know this the next day you, you, you launch your campaign. Even before launching you know your campaign, you can start understanding the consumer. And you can understand the type of uh, income level they have. So one, one thing to interject here, this data that you're showing us, Sandra, is none of it is declared data. It's all behavioral data that's actually being picked up through the placement of ads. Right, so, so in, a, in a literal way, one of the new ideas here is the advertising budget itself is research, right? Regardless of its efficacy for marketing, it's actually showing you a lot about your customers and how they engage. And the cool thing about it is you can, if you actually use the ads the right way, you can start showing different value propositions. So one ad can be about the benefits of this services company in terms of ease of use. Another can be about office locations. Another can be about uh, their ability to have a you know, great website where you can interact in many different ways. And now you can start seeing what income level, for example, reacted to one message or another. Now that can help you when you are trying to do a campaign outside online and you want to, for example, do a TV spot. You have a TV show targeting a specific audience. You can know exactly what advantage to show in those cases. And again, with software, you can start understanding what is the right way to reach consumers to maximize your ROI. And not center only in hand raisers, who are people who are kind of coming to you, but still start looking for prospecting and people who can be interested in you, uh, even though they haven't actually found, they haven't heard about you before. So we start increasing awareness on the very top of the funnel and bring people from not knowing you to be hand raisers, but you start to be interested in you and finally becoming consumers of your product. Great. Well, thanks for um, walking us through some of the insights, Sandro. Um, now we'd like to kind of wrap up by talking um, specifically about, about a case study, how this stuff is all put in play. And um, following that, maybe a few minutes for, for Q&A. So again, if, if you want to read more about, about the Ford case study, it's there from Forrester. But um, this is actually a really interesting case study because it does involve um, not just the sort of technology, but also how a brand and its agency are changing the way they work. So um, Ford, obviously Ford's doing great right now. Um, they've got some awesome new models. They've also got a really um, inspirational and, and very smart um, CMO. Um, in in uh, Mr. Farley, and he started from the premise that the way we're marketing cars in a digital world um, needs to change. We are uh, currently working in sort of product-specific silos around, you know, the Focus or, you know, the F-150. These teams are working independently, um, oftentimes doing business with, uh, you know, the same media companies even hitting, overlapping the same consumers, and yet none of this knowledge um, is aggregating to improve the overall intelligence of the brand uh, to understand consumers in this digital world. Um, Team Detroit has an agent, uh, excuse me, uh, Ford has an agency called Team Detroit, which is a part of the Mindshare group of WPP. Um, 
and uh, they, not surprisingly, were organized uh, and, and largely still are along channel-specific lines. And uh, so the idea was we need to get our marketing out of the, it's all about Ford silos of the nameplates and the channels and think more holistically about the customers out there, um, both our existing customers and the new ones, and engage them sort of when and as they are. So, um, you know, specifically there are issues where budgeting decisions happened, you know, within a whole brand and not dynamically based on consumer interest. Um, the team was, the teams, individual teams, uh, uh, both at the brand and the agency were struggling to, um, uh, you know, sort of master, you know, all the decisioning and analytics themselves and repeating that work. And um, they really weren't getting back rich, robust information from all their digital investments that helped them to better understand where they needed to go relative to the consumers. So what, what they did is um, uh, uh, several things uh, for a, a customer-centric approach. Um, first, they started to think about, could we reallocate the way we invest our advertising following consumer interest rather than the thing we want to sell? Obviously, you know, there are sales goals and there's marketing objectives, but can we um, sort of rewire um, the way we allocate the investments around the consumer? We'll talk about that. Um, can we start to measure um, the customer behavior in a way that identifies where they are in a purchase cycle, which for cars obviously can be a five-year process, and, and can we start to measure the behaviors that are indicators of this high-value activity occurring before it's obvious that somebody's in market and then lastly, to affect this change, um, they wanted to have a hands-on approach to technology, which means, um, again, not just sort of giving IOs uh, to media companies to fulfill the various marketing objectives, but taking the data inside, using, you know, using software, and using tools to manage how it's invested and to manage the data coming back from all the media partners. So. Um, the results from this changed way of working are, 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 are really pretty, pretty significant. Um, Forrester indicates you know, a more effective and coordinated team, but you know, when you get into the, the black uh, and white numbers, a 20% increase in marketing outcomes from basically showing the right creative to the right consumer um, throughout their investment. And I'll talk about that in a sec. But also just a 50% reduction in media cost um, through the program by just eliminating waste. So let me talk a little bit more specifically about what they did. Uh, the first thing was um, let's uh, measure all the investments we make in digital and bring it back into a central repository where we can understand the consumer segments, where we can separate out even anonymously who owns a car, one of our cars, and who doesn't, first of all, so we can sort of delineate acquisition and retention efforts. Um, so we'll, but we'll do this across our, 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 um, our investments. We'll pull this data back in. Secondly, we'll segment it. Um, and we'll do this, God bless you, in a way that we've done forever with the usual customer database, but now we'll do it with like cookie-based data, right, to understand you know, the anonymous browse behavior where consumers spend so much of their time now. Um, we'll use ad exchanges and a DSP to sort of bid in real time on the customers who are in market according to our data, and we'll pay more for those who are actually shopping for a car um, than we will for people who we're trying to just make aware because we want to close a sale. Beyond that, though, we'll take our customer segments and we'll map them to the model badges and we'll, um, we'll use those segments to actually change which ad a consumer sees when they go to one of our sponsorship properties. So um, imagine now, and I'll just make up a publisher at my cars.com where I'm coming there as a consumer um, and we're all familiar with this experience as consumers, you see the standard corporate sponsorship message. You know, maybe I'm going to CNN and I'm seeing an ad for BlackBerry. Uh, but I'm seeing an ad for a BlackBerry device that um, you know, wouldn't interest me. I, I'm interested in the Q10, let's say. What Ford has been doing is actually changing the creative based on who the consumer is, even in guaranteed and sponsored media. So beyond you know, the use of ad exchanges, and that um, to make customer-centric um, placement decisions. This raises a really interesting question. What happens when you know, Sandro runs the F-150 uh, brand manager, I'm you know, the Ford Focus, consumer comes in and seems like a Focus prospect, the ad goes to me, and Sandro says, but I have a budget to invest, and I need to hit sales targets. 
So now, now if you really become customer centric, this starts to sort of tease out some of the changes in how business needs to work to sort of flip it to base the decision on the customer. And how we pull each other from one out of these consumer who actually does want the car you're selling. Right. Yeah, but it creates a problem for, for, for departments. Can Sandra and I share budgets? And one of the really interesting things about this case study is um, less maybe our tool and just more the sort of corporate process change that you're starting to see some large brands affect to really fundamentally um, work around the customer rather than the you know, legacy ways of organizing. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, 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 uh, I'll stop on Ford and you know, be happy to take a few questions either about that case study or just more generally questions for Sandro or myself about um, how, how people are using data and analytics in, in customer-centric marketing. I'm actually an F-150 customer. And I just put on, the, on a, a forward focus property now. Because it seems like, in a perfect world, that's the way to go. Uh, but in, a, in reality, there seems to be a lot of intrinsic risk directing me down a certain channel that you've right. kind of right. come out of an algorithm yeah. with. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so the question was, um, if, if, uh, if I'm actually an owner of an F-150 but interested in a fusion, how do you sort of pick that up or do you just woodenly say, nope, because um, people's minds do change. Um, so literally how that happens is, um, and this may be old news or brand new news to some of you, is more and more businesses are now sort of taking their customer database where I know, I send emails to Sandro, I know he's a customer, Sandro ignores my emails because he gets so many, but I'm now actually appending you know, to my list, my customer database, cookies, so I can talk to Sandro as he browses. So that's one way where people are picking up on the signal of who is a current owner. And I would like to suppress, you know, the fusion advertising to this person. So that's, that's sort of mechanically how that would go. Now, is that good marketing? Um, we, when we run, we always run a, a control group that, you know, it's about 1% just randomizes the ads to actually try to pick up on, you know, is your decisioning good decisioning? Is it lifting over a baseline from a results perspective? Um, because your question really raises an interesting data science question, which is, um, as we try to know everything about consumers, um, does the creativity and the discovery get thrown out the window because we're rigidly following this like deterministic targeting path? That's something we think about a lot. And, and the alternative is you know, to use a probabilistic approach where you're always doing a little bit of exploration and for instance, running an A-B test or running some of your media randomized um, will give you some clues yes. as to that sort of dynamic. And to be on top of what uh, Mike mentioned, I mean, the model is always evaluating probabilities. So you as an F-150 owner who was starting to look, for example, for uh, uh, news about fuel economy, you may start thinking, you thinking may have started to change and the model will pick up on that and will shift the probabilities you want by showing you alternatives. Yeah, and it's, an example is where, where you don't have a cookie to make a decision about a segment. Um, one of the things that we've seen is to be quite effective is to look, you know, a, a, a geo-based lookup of where a consumer's from. Uh, it's the 024494 zip code where we actually know the Silverado, or, or they know, it, demographically that's a hot zone for that car. And so what we want to do is optimize the geography and the product. And most every brand knows, you know, has done some good ge granular geographic research on, on where the people are who are the best customers. So that's a way to get at that, um, even absent a, you know, a more fixed data point. Time for, I guess, one, one uh, maybe two questions. Yeah. Just shout it. Yeah, we will hear you. Okay, so um, <laughs> with the controlled experiments that you're talking about, are you testing whether targeting was effective or whether the added help Right, okay. So the question is, are you testing whether the targeting was effective or whether the creative was effective? Um, so we think of the problem this way. There's three domains. There's, you know, who's the, you know, the targeting, who's the customer, who's the consumer, and the second is the creative message, and the third is what's the context? You know, the, the media context or could semantic context or time of day, day of week context. So creative, consumer, context. What we do is we, we rate each of these data domains separately, and so you see how much lift is there overall coming from 
those three domains. What we found in general, so, so the answer is it's not targeting verse, it's not consumer versus creative, it's not creative versus context. Again, we, we tend to talk in these cartoon forms when newness hits us, and that's bad and this is good. It's not that simple. It's a multivariate problem. All three of these domains are relevant, and one needs to globally optimize across the three, right? So we've seen in general, um, we're not the company you'd expect to say this because we talk about algorithms so much, but the creative is as important as the consumer is um, in terms of, of how you invest. So um, in this particular case, we are using both. And, um, and interesting, we came back to Ford and said, hey, just based on engagement creatively, here's how we think you're marketing on TV um, to various parts of the country and even like minority groups because we, we just see it from the creative engagement um, by geography, um, which is an, another way to get the behavior. One last question. I saw the hand somewhere. Yes. So do you buy, uh, to help you in the programmatic uh, process, do you buy audience data first, or do you yeah. create the audience data? Uh, so great question. Uh, to help in the programmatic process, do, you, do, do we create audience data, or, or, or do we buy it from other people? So um, just to be clear, we make software. So DataZoo doesn't own media, doesn't own data, but we connect to 15 different data providers you know, over 30 different media providers. So you can like type in, you know, young, urban, female, likes radishes, and it'll come back and say, oh, here's like, you know, 10 different data segments you can buy. You buy that, you create your custom audience, you run it where you want to run it. So um, stepping up a level, there's first party data, which you collect from your owned and operated assets or your earned assets as well. Um, and then there's third-party data where, you know, Experian, Axiom, many of the traditional data providers offline now offer online products, which are really cookie-appended data, as do a number of startups. So, so we, we connect to all of them. And, uh, but the question's good because you're, you're going to, as a business, be using a composite of first and third party. We like to say your first-party data is really valuable. You should get all the juice out of that first and then overlay it with third party. So if you're a big advertiser like Fidelity, you have a tremendous opportunity and the sheer amount you spend gets you a lot of first party data. So there is leverage to be found from being um, a large scale investor in consumer marketing just through harvesting the first party data. Well, thank you very much.